The next Action Hub event will be starting in one minute. Please take your seat and switch your phone to silent. If you don't have a seat, we invite you to watch the event online on the UNF C website or on the COP platform, but please do not stand on the side of the Action Hub. Jessica Long, and I am the head of Ipsos's climate change and sustainability practice. And for those of you who might not know who Ipsos is, we are one of the largest insights and data research companies in the world. And I'm here today with my colleague Pippa, who also joins me uh, as part of the practice, to talk to you about myth busting some of the global opinion around climate change as well. And we're going to cover three areas today. First, we're going to talk about COVID's impact on climate change. We're going to myth bust some misperceptions that we see talked about quite a bit in the context of the pandemic and where climate change sits as a priority right now in the public's mind. Second, we're going to go into generational divides. We see a lot of young people being the face of this movement and we want to myth bust some of the sentiments around who really cares and who's doing what based upon their age. And number three, we want to address what's called the say-do gap, or the values action gap, known by many different types of names, but basically the discrepancy between what people say versus what they actually do. Because the industry and government routinely think of this as being one of the biggest challenges that face us in addressing climate change. But actually, we have some statistics that suggest that we need to look at this and reframe this in a different way than we currently are. Okay, so let's move on to our first myth versus fact. And that's that the COVID pandemic and all the kind of stress that that's created in our work lives, in our personal lives, and in the economy has eclipsed concern about climate change. Now, we often know that when things are very present in our mind, like COVID has been, that it can move other things to the back. I mean, even coming to this conference today, we've been thinking about, have we had our vaccinations that we need? Have we done all our lateral flow tests? Do I have a face mask? Have I got some hand sanitizer? All of that thought and stress takes up a lot of our mind. And so sometimes other important things can slip to the back. So let's have a look. Overall, the answer is no. COVID-19 has not dented climate concern. On this chart, you can see we've looked at agreement with the statement that we're heading for environmental disaster unless we change things immediately. So you can see very clearly an upward trajectory from 2016 to 2020. And particularly, you might see a little dip in 2019 and then a very steep rise again to 2020 on this chart. And there's good reason for that we have witnessed climate change across our planet. Let's be honest, if we review 2020, we had wildfires in Australia and the west coast of the United States. We've had more storms and hurricanes than we have ever seen. We've had flash flooding and many, many people have suffered across the globe. And also, let's not forget, 
record temperatures recorded in Death Valley of 54.4 degrees centigrade, which is almost unimaginable. And, you know, I don't think anyone can deny that this is happening, and these figures show that. In fact, we see that 70% of people globally are more worried in 2020 than they were in 2019. And one in three is much more concerned than they were. If we look to the very latest figures, which have only just been launched from Ipsos Global Trends Survey, we see that this has reached an all-time high of 83%. And it's very important when we remember this, this is across 25 countries, from Canada to Colombia, Colombia to China, Peru, the Philippines, South Africa, United States of America. It's across the globe. And in this Ipsos Global Trends Survey, we saw that climate emergency was the number one value out of 36 values which people held first. And we saw that climate skepticism was at 34 of 36. So what we can say as a fact is that climate emergency is the number one value that is held and unites the planet. When we think of the environment, and we set that in the context of other major issues and concerns that we all face, we can see that it's in fifth place here in 2020. And it has moved up one place and has overtaken unemployment. But what we see coming ahead of this is the things that people hold very personally to them the things that matter to them today, tomorrow, next week. We're thinking about our families, we're thinking about our security, we're thinking about our health and our well-being. And these things do come first. But we see that 71% of people say that the environment and climate change are as important as COVID as we move forward into the long term. And, you know, given how present COVID still is, I mean, let's be honest, just looking out at an audience of people wearing masks is very much with us. So the very fact that this is given equal weighting uh, to the environment and they're there together uh, is important. And we see that 50% of people say that priority should be given to the environment over and above the economic growth of the country. Now, this is really important because this actually represents 30 countries across the globe where the environment, economic, social and political conditions are very, very different. It's not just the developed economies, it's the emerging economies too. So, myth or fact? Has COVID-19 eclipsed uh, concern about climate change? No, it hasn't. Concern about the climate is higher than it's ever been. We saw that 83%. And we know that, yes, obviously, personal values such as the security of our family and our immediate well-being will always be primary. So moving on to our second myth versus fact, and that's that young people care more about the environment and climate change than older people. Myth or fact? Well, what we see here is that we've got four different age groups shown on this slide, and then a global total shown on the right-hand side. The percentages shown in red are those that are significantly lower than the global average, and those that are shown in green are significantly higher than the global average. So if we read from the top, what we can see is that everybody is concerned about the environment. Everybody is worried, 70% or more. But what we see is the youth are angry, and so they should be. Uh, they're angry about the state of the world in which they have come into. They're angry about how future generations, the decisions and actions that have been made, have brought us to this point here. But we see that they're less skeptical. They accept that this is going on. They accept that you know, climate change is happening and it's very real. But we see almost a quarter of 55 plus year olds think that 
you know, is it really going on? Is, is climate change a real thing? Isn't it just extreme weather conditions? Um, and this is interesting. But also, we're seeing some polarization amongst the young. You can see, yes, they're angry. A third of them are really angry. But we also see some indifference. And all right, this is a much lower percentage, only 13%. But compared to the eldest age group that we're showing here, they are indifferent. And I think that this is worth exploring further. Now, a lot is written about generational cohorts. And you know, the millennials are much maligned or have been in the press as snowflakes. But this Generation Z, which is kind of nine to 24 year olds, has gained a lot of attention because their attitudes seem to be different uh, than those of older generations, or that is what has been suggested. And, you know, we've had some great youth speakers um, here over these last two weeks. I don't need to mention Greta Thunberg, but uh, obviously now a household name. But we've also had uh, great people, you know, young people who were talking and wanted to change the future and make things better, like Venetia Umenschenka, who was obviously shortlisted for the Earthshot Prize and who won a million pounds in order to take her idea forward. So, you know, these young people are worth listening to. But what we see is that young people are more fatalistic. And this is a concern. We see that one in five young people, and in this case it's young adults, so it's less than 35 years of age, are saying that it's already too late. It's already gone. We've come here. It's already done. There's nothing that we can do. And that compares to only one in 10 of the oldest age group that we looked at. And it is worrying because with skepticism comes inaction. And why, why do we think that this may be? Why do we think that uh, these young people are feeling skeptical? It's because, you know, media has a very strong role to play here. These young people are never far away from their smartphone and nor are any of us, to be honest. But compared to when I was their age, they're exposed to so much more. Stories are popping up on their feeds all the time. They get exposed to everything that's happening in the, on, around the globe. They know immediately what's happening in India or China in, or in America. By the time they wake up, they're already flooded with stories. They know what's going on. And, you know, this has a real uh, impact. And we see that 40% of them say that they hear far more about the negative impact of the uh, climate change than they do about any positive stories to do with you know, how science and technology might potentially be able to help us. And we only need to look to you know, some of the podcasts that were listened to or were aired in the last couple of weeks from these young people because they are the ones saying, I'm frightened, I'm terrified, I'm anxious, truly anxious. Uh, such that, you know, some are saying that they're not going to have children because they don't want to burden the planet further. So this is very real, this eco-anxiety amongst the young. And what we do know from research at Ipsos is that bad news on social media travels six times faster than good news. And that's a fact and something for us to think about. But on the positive side, and again, we've seen witness here today, we've seen people gather in the streets in their thousands, not only in Glasgow, but around the world, that, you know, the young are taking action and they are wanting their voice to be heard. We see stronger presence of young people who are attending protests, who are putting their name to petitions, and also directionally, or right ahead of the oldest age group, are boycotting brands and companies who are not doing the right thing. And we, we, set, we ourselves at Ipsos know that it's important for these young people that the company that they're joining is responsible at many levels. So, myth versus fact. Are the young more concerned about climate change and the environment than older people? No, everyone's concerned, but the young are more angry. And they, so they should be. It's their future. 
And we also see that there's more skepticism. So we are seeing this kind of polarization between the groups in this younger age bracket. And it's important that they don't feel helpless, that they don't feel that there's not hope that can come and help them, things that can be uh, solved. But they also are taking more action. They're, they're making their voices heard by their presence and by their um, entrepreneurial spirit in trying to improve the state of play. So that takes us to myth versus fact number three. The citizens say do gap and how that is frequently talked about as being one of the biggest challenges industry and government face. You know, oh, they're not willing to pay or they're not willing to do this, so why should we bother, yeah? And what we really want to know is, do people really just know what to do and just aren't willing to pull their weight? Because oftentimes that's the assumption. And to some extent, the say-do gap is a massive challenge. If you look at the recent Ipsos data, the last seven years, so Pippa's just talked about how concern for climate change has gone through the roof. It's not a trend. It's not going anywhere. It's outlasted a pandemic. It's at an all-time high ever. But yet, we look at different behaviors. Doesn't matter what it is. Saving energy at home. Not buying as many goods. Eating less dairy. Eating less meat. Maybe not uh, driving your car so much and deciding to take public transport. It doesn't really matter. We're not seeing significant changes that you would assume that you would. If concern is higher, logically, you'd think, okay, behavior would be higher. But again, we're not seeing that change. So the question is, why? Well, we talk again. Again, this kind of comes into this umbrella term of the say-do gap. Again, values, action gap, whatever you want to call it. But this is really an umbrella term. This is really a catch-all term that is only the tip of the iceberg. It doesn't even begin to touch upon the barriers, the motivators, the drivers that industry and government should be talking about. So rather than using a reductionist term like the say-do gap, why aren't we talking about things like shared responsibility? What do the public feel their responsibility is in terms of pulling their own weight versus industry, versus government, versus civil society? What is their knowledge, awareness, and understanding of this issue? Do they even know what to do? Do they know what to prioritize? And also, this paradox of choice. You've just seen a whole list of different actions on sustainable behavior. How are you meant to prioritize and decide what you can do? And what's actually you're responsible for and is going to have the lar largest impact? Are we, in the industry and government sectors, are we making it easy for people to engage? Well, let's look at shared responsibility. First and foremost, the public feel they're doing enough. This is our most recent UK data that was released last year in a uh, joint study that we did with EDF Energy. And what we find is, if you look at this graph, the dark blue is should take action. The light blue is actually taking action. And below is a composite score basically that says, if you have a negative score, you're probably not doing what you should be doing from a public per uh, perception standpoint. And if you have a positive score, you're probably doing more than you should be doing, pulling your own weight. And we see here that industry and government aren't doing enough from a public perception, yeah? They're not pulling their own weight. But what's most interesting is that citizens and consumers feel that they are. They're over-delivering. They're doing more than their fair share. So it's not surprising when we talk about well, they're not willing to pay, or the majority is not necessarily willing to pay, or they're not necessarily wanting to engage in actions that require excess friction, excess time, excess energy, excess inconvenience for them. Well, of course not. If they feel they're pulling their weight, then logically they probably aren't going to do it. So we kind of say, well, if it's not easy, it's probably not happening for the majority of people. Then I want to take you to awareness and understanding, and I want to unpick that a bit as well. So globally, we have our perils of perception of the environment data that we released on Earth Day last year on April 22nd. And seven in 10 people feel that they know what to do to reduce their own carbon emissions. They said, yep, well, we know. We know exactly what to do. We feel confident that we know what to prioritize. And we said, okay, do you really? So we said, what are the top three? Tell us what the top three most impactful actions you can do to reduce your carbon emissions. 
And surprise, surprise, nearly six out of 10 people globally said recycling when we know that less than 9% of what you put in your recycle bin actually makes it to the recycle bin itself. So not even the top three, not even the top five. So if you look here, we have the actual ranking, and it shows that there's almost an inverse relationship between what people think are the most impactful actions versus the least impactful actions. They overestimate the least impactful actions, and they underestimate the most impactful actions. And obviously you see here at the very part, the number one most important thing you could do is not have more children. Obviously, I didn't, uh, I didn't comply with that one. <laughs> but, but to say, this isn't necessarily saying what people feel comfortable doing. This is just an awareness thing, right? So if people don't know where to prioritize or what to do, government and industry have a responsibility to help lead people into why we're asking them to engage in certain areas rather than just recycle, 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 recycle. And even when people want to do well in this space, we don't make it easy for them, right? In the UK alone, 87 plus different eco-labels. Can you imagine the insight that's required to discern? You're just gonna go buy some, I don't know, milk, and you have to discern between recyclable packaging, made from recycled materials, um, sustainably sourced materials, perhaps if you're buying, you know, chocolate or something. It, there's so many different things to consider. How is the average consumer meant to discern the trade-offs between each other and, and every one of these, right? And not only that, we're just talking eco-labels. We're not even talking fair trade and social labels or certification schemes, right? So the mental capacity as well. So you end up having somebody who's going to the store, wants to get groceries, and sitting there trying to figure out all the trade-offs, which can be very, very confusing. So again, that frictionless attempt to try to get people on board is absolutely critical and something industry and government must do better. So in short, the citizens say do gap, is it the biggest challenge? It's a challenge, but it's not the one that we should be focusing on. We should be breaking that down. We should be looking beneath the iceberg. We should be thinking about the fact that people feel they're doing more than their fair share. We need to think about the fact that people need help in understanding the most impactful actions to take and what industry and government's roles is in, in terms of responsibility and clarifying that message, but not from a lecturing standpoint, not from a here I'm going to here to teach you standpoint, but from a show versus tell standpoint, lead by example standpoint, and make it easy for them to engage. So in short, <clears throat> Climate change concern is higher than ever, as Pippa has said. Government and industry have a mandate to act and do something. We don't need to ask for permission anymore. If we asked for permission and had a referendum on a congestion zone in London, do you think we would have a congestion zone in London? Probably not. Number two, everyone is worried. It's not just the young people, right? But also there's a critical opportunity for media here, if everyone's facing eco-anxiety, yes, as Pippa's mentioned, younger people are angrier, and to some degree, more indifferent as well, but media has a critical role. Rather than being doomsday and alarmist all the time, and I get that that's real, I get that it's scary, we need to also be solution-oriented. We need to give people direction of, and this is what you can do about it, and this is what we're doing about it. Because all that negative press leads to Indifference and eco-anxiety, which leads to then inaction, which is the very opposite of what we want when we're talking about engaging the public. And then finally, people feel they're doing enough. Yeah? But they need help. They need leadership. Government and industry must seek a way to engage them that isn't excess friction when they feel they're pulling their own weight and industry and government isn't. And then we need to ensure that we're leading the way in a way that's actually transparent, accountable, and again, isn't tell, but is more show. Thank you very much. We have a few minutes for questions if anyone has one. Hello, 
Hi, my name's Rebecca from the Cadence Roundtable. Um, uh, my question really is to understand the extent to which COVID might have dented uh, concern about climate change, given the amount of climate change that we saw happening in 2020. So is it, is it going up in the trajectory that you would expect, or do you think COVID has had some impact but not eclipsed? Thank you. Um, so given the data that we've got, given the data we, that we've seen, I think um, that very steep uh, climb that we saw between 2019 and 2020 is greater than we saw it because of the experience of the, it, you know, it became obvious, almost impossible to ignore the effect of climate change happening around the globe. So, you know, that was one factor. Obviously, COVID-19 has been huge. I mean, the disruption over the last two years, um, undeniable. So the fact that climate has, you know, fought through that, even though, you know, a lot of us are working at home, you know, haven't seen loved ones, you know, during the period of time, haven't been able to connect with colleagues. So much in our life has changed because of COVID-19. You could easily think that the environment would slip back. So I would say not. I would say that COVID-19 hasn't. Um, prevented people but but as I kind of the point that I was making in the presentation that people will always focus immediately on the day-to-day -day. like are my family safe um, have we got have I got enough money to feed my family have I got the resources to feed my family and make sure that they're they're healthy um, those things will always be somewhat primary I think irrespective um, but no um, given what we've seen um, and the kind of acceleration in terms of people who are worried and say that we need to act now um, is it in the direction that we would have expected and perhaps more so. More so. There no, yeah. Cool. Yeah, sorry. Uh, we've just got a question on this side as well, sorry. Uh, Oh, sorry. <laughs> Hello, no problem. Um, yeah, thank you so much. That was really interesting. Um, I was wondering, there's obviously a big say-do gap for politicians and policymakers as well, um, and also uh, a gap between the scale of what has been pledged and what needs to be pledged on a quite scary scale. Yep. Um, I was wondering if you'd done any similar studies into the the reason for the say do gap for policymakers, uh, and whether that's something you might consider in the future. That's a tricky one, isn't it? <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's it's tricky because we're doing quantitative um, sampling and 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 surveys, and so then how then does that translate? What we do find is that, and this is a bit unfortunate, even though though, so so obviously government and uh, industry tend to be a bit reactive in the space. They tend to look to where are you going to get your votes or who's going to buy my product, etc. <clears throat> and we're, we're trying to challenge that with some of the data that we have that suggests, again, that they want that type of leadership. But unfortunately, what we see as well is communications in this space isn't great. So even when uh, companies have net, uh, not companies, sorry, um, countries have net zero policies in place, the majority of the public don't know that that's, that's happening. The majority of the public isn't aware of what's happening, what's going on. And we have a lot to learn, I think, from the pandemic in terms of communications and how you bring people on board as well. Because until that happens, that pressure from the, from the public isn't as felt as acutely from a government perspective. I think that's changing with events like this, with COP26. But um, we have, you know, we, we do kind of do our, we, we do have kind of private, um, smaller scale surveys that we do, but nothing that addresses on the global scale in the remit that we presented today. But I completely get your point. The say do gap for industry and government is a massive concern as well. Amazing, thank you. So on your question about the, how people see the trade-off between the economy and the environment, um, nothing wrong with asking that question. It's been a long asked question, but now we're seeing that of course with the right investments and actions, there doesn't have to be a direct one-for-one one trade off between economic um, growth or economic change and the environment. And so I wonder if there's a way of beginning to get at that nuance um, rather than just, you know, continuing to present the idea that there's a direct one-for-one one trade off. Yeah, 100%. I mean, we know that ESG stocks, for example, outperformed um, standard during, during the pandemic as well, and that is changing as well. Um, but 
we also know that where sustainability initiatives and climate change initiatives and products, for example, resonate the most with the general public when with consumers is when they're positioned as a co-benefit. Because again, it comes back to that point about people feeling that they're doing enough. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a negative trade-off but where it's positioned as a, a, you know, for example, you might have a Colgate toothpaste packet and it's, uh, it's, it's recyclable, but it also allows you to get more of the product out of your, uh, the pack. Well, then that's value for money, right? And it's about that, that positioning that helps that co-benefit, sustainability as a co-benefit rather than the sole carrot that helps people engage better in this space. But I completely get your point as well. It's not necessarily about trade-offs anymore. It's about Again, the, the, yeah, the position of the benefit as well. Hi. Um, I'm a visiting professor at a university. Uh, our university developed a program of something academically called carbon literacy training. But it's a program which has been designed with um, psychologists as much as climate scientists to effectively reverse your chart to show people what is real and, and what their perceptions are. To date, it's been used in organizations and, and big corporates often mandated very successfully. We'd like to take that out to the general public. My question is, is there anything in your research or your belief system that says um, that people would accept in some manner this form of education, we might call it, to help them reprioritize that chart? I mean, really, really interesting. Um, we have a behavior change lab that uh, works with this and looks at, you know, how we can help people um, make, you know, like you say, better understand. I mean, as Jess said, some of it's about communication and people just not knowing what's the most important thing to do. And we have more recently undertaken an interesting kind of ethnographic study where we gave people information uh, to put around their homes and, s and saw, you know, does this cause change? You know, do we see that people will change their behavior? And I think it's some, some of it is about that top of mind as well. So it's communications, but also the reminders to encourage people. So yeah, an, an interesting idea. And, and I think all of these things can help. Thank you. I think we're out of time. Thank you guys so much for having us. Thank you for attending. The event is now over. Please vacate the Action Hub so our team can clean the room.